What's going on, Warlords of History fans? Stu Blackwell here, host of the Warrior Legacy podcast. Have you ever listened to the stories of men like Hannibal or Caesar or Napoleon and wondered what they would look like in today's world? Have you ever thought about like the cultures that they established in their armies and what it would be like to see the modern equivalent of that? Come join me on the Warrior Legacy podcast where I offer a visceral and un filtered examination of modern infantry culture from my experience as a grunt in the global war on terror. Here, we examine the values that were passed on from men like Hannibal to the current generation of war fighters and how they shape the infantry's development. Join me as I recount the examples of men that followed similar paths to history's greatest titans, forever altering the trajectory of an entire generation. In November 218 BC, cold and damp, under the dreary late autumn gray-colored clouds above, from which a gentle rain was pouring, pelting softly against his armor, the 18-year-old Publius Cornelius Scipio sat mounted on his horse, situated on a hilltop just to the west of the Tachinus River in northern Italy, accompanied by his small group of cavalry ordered to wait there out of harm's reach at the command of his father, the consul in charge of 8,600 Roman soldiers that were now locked in battle with the 6,000 Carthaginian invaders on the flatland plains below, an encounter that would later be called the Battle of Ticinus, the first battle of the Second Punic War. And although hours prior at the onset of the engagement, Scipio's group, from the safety of their vantage point, had been quite animated, talking and pointing out to each other the tactical formations and strategies being utilized by each side, the strange appearance of the troops making up the motley Carthaginian force from so many far-off distant lands. As the battle progressed, they had since fallen into a stunned silence. Silence broken only by the sounds echoing out from the battle that was raging down below. The fierce shouts of thousands of warriors amidst weapons clashing and the horrific screams of dying men and horses. Scipio taking a moment to look over at his childhood friend, Gaius Lelius, their grim expressions darkly mirroring each other. With each passing minute, adding to the ominous sense of distress over what they were witnessing. Largely attributed to one man, the Carthaginian general Hannibal Barca. Too far away for Scipio to see his features, but unmistakable by his presence in the field, issuing out commands to his troops. A bold and clearly skilled general that had astonishingly just weeks past managed what the Romans believed unthinkable in gaining entry to the Italian peninsula by the way of an audacious land invasion, having marched his army over an incredible distance of 1,500 kilometers, all the way from southern Hispania through Gaul to break through the sharp, snow-capped peaks of the Alps, the mountain range that dominated the northern Italian landscape some 100 kilometers to the north of the battlefield, where they now found themselves at. Also where, Hannibal had brilliantly led his troops to take full control of the encounter, headlined by his North African light cavalry, the Numidians, that assailed the Roman heavy horse like a disturbed hornet's nest in a seemingly wild series of uncoordinated attacks and charges but that Scipio could readily see was organized in its chaos, steadily pushing the Roman cavalry wings inwards into their center contingent that had already been battling it out with the opposing Carthaginian center for some time, and that was gradually causing the entire Roman army to become tightly compressed, tangling into one another without adequate space to maneuver and maintain their formations. Scipio's attention pulled to his father, who, in a last-ditch effort to salvage the situation and create some vital breathing space for his army to reorganize, 
ordered the Roman reserve cavalry into the fray. However, a command that left him vulnerable, protected by only a few guards, which didn't escape the notice of the Numidians, a detachment of which subsequently darted off to target the Roman consul, causing Scipio's eyes to widen in alarm, tightly gripping the reins of his mount. And upon seeing his father moments later, terribly wounded by a javelin cast into his thigh, fall from his horse, without hesitation, in a brave and flagrant disregard for the dangers at hand, the young Scipio kicked his heels into the flanks of his horse to begin racing down the slope, determined to come to the aid of his surrounded and gravely wounded father. Welcome to the Warlords of History podcast. I'm your host, Mark Pimenta. And to part two of the series on the phenomenal lifetime and exploits of Scipio Africanus, a magnificent commander, never bested on the field of battle, firmly among the top tier of military leaders to ever have emerged out of Rome throughout the course of its incredibly long 2200 year history, from the birth of the kingdom in 753 BC to the fall of Constantinople in 1453, and that, at the very essence of his story, played a foundational role in saving the Roman Republic when confronted with the very real possibility of ruin during the Second Punic War at the hands of Carthage, more specifically, at the hands of the Carthaginian general Hannibal Barca. Another name, certainly situated among the greatest military leaders of antiquity, widely regarded as a tactical genius, and who we'll get to know in much more detail in this episode. Along with how, after being defeated in the First Punic War in 241 BC, left in a dismal state, the Carthaginian Empire experienced a remarkable, phoenix-like revival centered in Hispania, the Iberian Peninsula, that enabled them to quickly rebuild, both financially and military-wise, to emerge stronger than ever. This happening right under the noses of the Romans, who were focused elsewhere, fighting to tighten their grip on Cisalpine Gaul in northern Italy and along the eastern coastlines of the Adriatic. Distracted from the rapidly growing menace that was soon to emerge out of Carthaginian Spain, when rule over these domains was placed into the hands of Hannibal in 221 BC, who had been born and bred to smolder with an unyielding hatred towards Rome, and from the tender age of ten, trained for war, destined to right the wrongs inflicted upon Carthage, the humiliations it suffered due to the First Punic War and its aftershocks a destiny he endeavored to fulfill in 218 BC by igniting the Second Punic War, assembling a fearsome army that he led to assault the Roman Republic unbelievably by the way of a land invasion, an incredibly arduous and audacious march starting from Spain through Gaul, today France, topped off by traversing the Alps to land in northern Italy and launch his devastating campaign where the young Scipio, at the start of his military career within his father's army, would be at the forefront of the Roman Republic's initial attempts to stop Hannibal's advance. Both attempts ending in failure, unable to block the path of the Carthaginian army as they made their way through Gaul en route to Italy, which forced Scipio and his father to return there as well, leading to the Battle of Ticinus in November 218 BC the first engagement of the Second Punic War, wherein Scipio would lay witness to Hannibal's terrifying tactical genius, yet bravely charge into the messy fray to save his father's life. However, before we get into all of this, it's time for some important shoutouts. Because I have the distinct honor of welcoming Eitan T as an honorary member along with Fail Rock and Billy Bryan as the newest, full-fledged additions 
into the ranks of the warlords of history, immortals. My heartfelt thanks goes to you for supporting my efforts here, with a wider thanks also going out to all the existing immortals for your ongoing support through the Warlords of History Patreon page. Now, as a quick reminder, this episode forms part two of the series on Scipio Africanus, meaning that if you haven't yet had a chance to listen to part one, you might want to do that first. But regardless, whether you're new to the podcast or returning, here's a brief summary of what we covered in the previous installment to help bring you up to speed or refresh your memory as to where we last ended up. Where we began by exploring the rise of Rome in the lead up to Scipio's birth in 236 BC, its growing hegemony over the Italian peninsula, and political evolution from a small city-centric kingdom in the mid-8th century BC into that of a republic in the 5th century BC. From its very beginnings, steeped in a fiercely competitive environment, battling every step of the way in the defense of their city, but also for greater access to land, resources, and influence. That forged the Romans into a definitive warrior culture wherein proportions of its citizen base would be levied and trained on an annual basis to fill out the ranks of their armies, the legions, in a constant state of readiness to deal with any impending threats or in the expansion of Roman interests. Led by its aristocratic patrician families, the Roman elite, that at the time of Scipio's era, known today as the Middle Republic, accounted for the vast majority of Rome's senate seats its highest individual political offices and military commands, like the family that Scipio was born into, the Cornelii Scipionis. Families competing with one another in a relentless struggle to win accolades for Rome, striving for achievement and distinction versus their counterparts, thereby adding to the dignitas of their respective houses, that Roman virtue associated with familial honor and glory also linked to one's personal standing and reputation among their peers. And consequently, the intense expectations that would be saddled upon patrician male children to build upon the successes of their ancestors. A sharp influence that Scipio would have most certainly felt, impacting what his upbringing would have looked like amidst the cultural and religious forces that were swirling about in his environment including, of course, rigorous military training, in preparation for his future service in the legions, a step that was of vital importance for any citizen seeking to climb the res publica's political ladder to its highest rungs. Though for Scipio, not just expected to participate, but to excel and lead, in accordance with the examples more recently set by his father and uncle, within a long line of Corneli Scipione ancestors that had played a leading role in Rome's wars and historic expansion. An expansion that accelerated from the 4th century BC onwards, conquering much of central Italy by around 290 BC, the Greek-founded colonies of southern Italy by the late 270s BC, followed by the First Punic War against Carthage in 264. A 23-year slog of a war that put Roman dedication to seeing a task through, no matter how high the cost, to the test on an entirely different level, alluding to another of their prized virtues, gravitas. Building a naval fleet from ground zero to ultimately defeat Carthage in 241, winning control of Sicily, and then boldly reach for more annexing the islands of Corsica and Sardinia from the Carthaginians in the years that followed. A sequence of conquests that altogether worked to affirm Rome's dominance over Italy up to the Arno River in modern Tuscany, though not by asserting direct control over their defeated Italian foes, but rather by imposing bilateral alliances upon them which became a key aspect of the Roman Republic's growing military strength, 
since the main provision required of its allies was to provide soldiers on demand, thus fueling the Roman war machine, ever deepening the pool of recruits from which its legions were drawn. And during Scipio's youth, from birth through to adolescence, 236 to 219 BC, when he was about 17, since Carthage, after the First Punic War, with their once dominant fleet now lying in shattered ruins at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, in economic and political dire straits, were no longer viewed as a credible threat by the Roman Senate, the legions over these years were now turned northwards from Rome, marching beyond the Arno River into Cisalpine Gaul, the Po Valley in northern Italy, and also sailing eastwards across the Adriatic, along the coastlines of Illyria, today the Croatian coast, focusing on these theatres to broaden the Res Publica's territorial reach and influence. Bringing us back to where we left everything off in Part 1, in June 218 BC, with the 18-year-old Scipio at the onset of his military indoctrination, having joined in his father's army, the man from which he also took his name, Publius Cornelius Scipio. But for the sake of clarity, since his father features quite prominently in this episode, I'll start referring to as Scipio Sr. A seasoned, respected, and reportedly more than capable commander. And although it's not explicitly known as to all the conflicts he had been previously involved in, it's more than likely that at least one of the campaigns had been in the Po Valley of northern Italy, as one of the highest ranking officers within the army of his brother, Scipio's uncle, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Calvus, who had been elected consul four years prior, in 222 BC, and quite successful in leading Roman armies to subdue the unruly tribes of Cisalpine Gaul. Nevertheless, in 218 BC, it was now Scipio's father's turn, Scipio Sr., to be elected consul for that year, and placed in command of three to four legions, some 14 to 20,000 Roman and allied troops. That, in addition to his son, our Scipio, who had been given a minor role, something akin to that of a junior cavalry officer, in charge of a small handful of horsemen one of these being a close childhood friend by the name of Gaius Laelius, who will later play an important role in Scipio's campaigns. This force also included Scipio's uncle, Gnaeus, but now acting as second in command to Scipio Sr. And after the customary four-month training period of the newly levied troops, consisting of long marches, formation drilling, mock battles, and overall physical conditioning, that would have taken place on the training grounds just outside of Rome, the Campus Martius. Scipio Sr., towards late June, began leading his legions due north from the Eternal City, aiming for the Po Valley, intending to launch a campaign against two of the most powerful Gallic tribes that resided there, known as the Boii and the Insubres, both having been soundly defeated by Rome in recent years and afterwards, as per the custom, accepting alliances with Rome as well. Yet, for reasons that will become much clearer to us a little later on, in early 218, chose this moment to cast their recently signed alliances with Rome aside, band together, and begin raiding and assaulting the newest Roman colonies founded in the region. Namely Cremona, on the northern bank of the Po River, and Placentia on the southern bank, each site about a hundred kilometers to the southeast of the modern Italian city Milan. And of note is that Scipio Sr.'s army had been directed north by the Roman Senate, despite their recent declaration of war against the Carthaginian Empire in late 219 BC. The main idea here being that, only after once again bringing the Gauls to heel, the original primary objective of Scipio Sr.'s consulship. Only then would his troops be turned westwards from northern Italy to begin attacking Carthage's domains in Spain. Which might be causing you to think, why the intense focus on Cisalpine Gaul? 
when it was really Carthage under its legendary commander Hannibal Barca that would emerge as the overwhelming threat to Rome. The answer to that, contrary to popular belief, is because Carthage at this time was not regarded as being much of an immediate threat to the Roman Republic, whereas the Boii and Insubres, the Gallic tribes that the ancient Greek historian Polybius named as the two largest in Cisalpine Gaul, even when standing alone made for formidable foes. But what they now represented, working together, was a far more dangerous, pressing, and direct threat to Roman lands and its citizens. The citizens that had just arrived to begin newly residing within and farming the lands around the two most recent Roman colonies founded in the Po Valley, Cremona and Placentia. Fortified frontier settlements, which, as discussed in the previous episode, had long been the Roman practice to set up such colonies, after the Republic had become embroiled in war and emerged victorious against other nations of the Italian peninsula, and imposed a bilateral alliance upon whomever they had defeated. And in this case, for the tribal nations of Cisalpine Gaul, including the Boii and Insubres, the culmination of an approximately decade-long conflict with Rome, fought throughout the 220s BC, that had been happening while Scipio was maturing from a young boy into adolescence back in Rome. What were the driving factors behind Rome's interest in Cisalpine Gaul? In part, they were attracted to the exceptionally fertile, highly productive agricultural lands to be found there, with nutrient and mineral-rich waters, starting from the Alps, fed throughout the region by the Po River and its tributaries, that also benefits from even distribution of rainfall throughout the year. But I think this more so taking a backseat to the primary motives, domestic security and defense. In that, as noted in Part 1, going back centuries, Rome and its central Italian allies had often been forced to deal with sporadic raids and invasions from the various Gallic tribes, fueling a long-held belief among Romans that, according to Polybius, as long as they had these Celts threatening their frontier, not only would they never be masters of Italy, but they would not even be safe in Rome itself also meaning that, if they could extend their hegemony over the whole of Italy, in the north up to the Alps, along with the rest of the peninsula being surrounded by the sea, these naturally strategic defensive barriers would provide the Republic with a phenomenal deterrent to any external entities, any would-be attackers. But before we delve deeper into this messy political situation that was Cisalpine Gaul, Let's quickly clear up a definition regarding the inhabitants there, sometimes called Gauls, sometimes Celts, because both names are in fact correct. The Celts, referring to a broader collection of Indo-European peoples that spread out mainly throughout Europe during the Iron Age, with the Gauls being the Celtic tribes that had settled into much of what is today France, Belgium, Switzerland, Southern Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic, and of course, most pertinent to our story, in northern Italy, which we already touched on too, the Boii and Insubres, this included the Torini and Senomani, among many others that resided there. Fierce, politically independent-minded tribal nations that rarely worked together, and more often than not were at violent odds with one another, jostling for territory but even within the tribes themselves, sometimes racked with disunity due to warring clans vying for control. Yet all of whom had increasingly come into direct contact with Rome in the 220s BC. At the dawning of that decade, after defeating two serious Gallic invasions, the Roman Republic proceeding to push aggressively inwards, using a skilled blend of overt military force and clever negotiations, manipulating existing tensions to establish alliances with various Gallic tribes and clans that were put to use to defeat others. And that altogether enabled Rome to establish a foothold in the north, 
realized through its use of colonies. Though it has to be emphasized that, at this juncture in 218 BC, Roman domination over the tribes of Cisalpine Gaul was far from complete, with many seething in discontent, perhaps felt most strongly amongst the Boii and Insubres, that had both, in the more recent years leading up to 218, fought against and been defeated by Roman legions, forced to submit and swallow down alliances. Amidst deep concern among the wider grouping of Gallic tribes as to the growing Roman presence. And for those that had agreed to alliances with Rome, whether willing or coerced, all of these established on extremely shaky grounds. Then, of course, when the Boi and the Insubres, with their anger finally boiling over, upon seeing Roman colonies start popping up on their lands, overturned their alliances joined forces and in revenge began harassing and raiding against Roman colonies and garrisons, the eruption of these fierce Gallic attacks on Cremona and Placentia in 218 gives us a much better sense as to why Rome was focusing so much of their military efforts in Cisalpine Gaul, instead of descending upon their Punic foes with everything they had, again despite having declared war against Carthage in late 219 BC. Although it must be said that they weren't wholly neglecting the Carthaginians, being that the consul elected alongside Scipio Sr. for 218, Tiberius Sempronius Longus, had been sent by the Roman Senate with his legions to Sicily, where they began readying for an invasion directly into North Africa to attack the Punic heartland. But what's interesting here is is that they weren't proceeding with a sense of urgency in this endeavor, since they felt that time was on their side. And as Barry Strauss points out in his book Masters of Command, the Roman Senate believed Carthage only capable of waging a defensive war, which lulled them into a false sense of security, thinking they were insulated from the reach of the Carthaginians and any significant attacks on Italian soil. Understanding that, the Carthaginian reach, via their once glorious naval fleet, had been absolutely smashed during the First Punic War, with Rome picking up the baton as the undisputed sea power of the Western Mediterranean. And this, in combination with the strenuous toll of the war effort, compounded by the terms of the humiliating peace treaty, in particular the loss of Sicily and the heavy war indemnities to be paid out to Rome, these factors caused the Carthaginian Empire to fall into serious economic and civil disarray, under tremendous financial strain that led to further domestic turmoil, and exploded into full-out civil war, while also leaving Carthage powerless to stop Rome when it annexed the islands of Corsica and Sardinia in the years following the close of the First Punic War. In the same breath, all these factors, along with the steady progression of successes in Cisalpine Gaul and the Illyrian coastline throughout the 220s, adding to the confidence of the Roman Republic that was at an all-time high, riding a wave of spectacular momentum, at the core of which was their unwavering belief in the superiority of their military forces, their navy and indomitable legions. And while Rome was certainly aware that the Carthaginian Empire, in between the First and Second Punic Wars, had since increased their holdings in Spain, of course with the Carthaginian capital located in North Africa, the overriding belief was that the only reasonable way Carthage could mount a serious direct attack was by transporting its army by sea, where Rome held naval superiority. In 218 BC, possessing an estimated 220 quincareems, and triremes as well, perhaps all in a fleet counting up to 300 warships, in comparison to Carthage's navy that hovered just above 100 vessels, thereby adding to Rome's sense of security, thinking they were beyond Carthage's reach, and again, despite being at war with them, the Roman Senate continuing to deprioritize actions against Carthage 
in favor of its other areas of interest. A decision that would come back to haunt them in unimaginable ways. And to their future detriment, their near future collapse, as would become shockingly clear in the years to come, the Roman Republic grossly underestimating the scope of the incredible Carthaginian revival in the few decades in between the end of the first and beginning of the Second Punic War. Not appreciating the extent of Carthage's renewed economic and military strength by 218 BC, and as emphasized by David Potter in his book, The Origin of Empire, Rome from the Republic to Hadrian, when he says, That Carthage, thanks largely to the activity of Hannibal's family in Spain during the previous years, had become vastly stronger than ever before. Headlined by the over 100,000 strong, exceptionally skilled and professional army situated in Spain in the hands of Hannibal Barca, though he remained of unknown quality to the Romans at the time, would reveal himself a military genius and all too aware of the constraints facing him, and that a naval invasion was off the table. But herein lies part of his genius, because Hannibal would find a way to hit at Rome where they felt most secure, doing the unthinkable, and personally invade the Roman Republic on its home soils. And that, by proxy, Hannibal's hand had already reached them, bringing war to its domains before even leaving Spain, since in late 219 BC, months prior to starting his epic march, Hannibal had established alliances with the Boii and the Insubres tribes of Cisalpine Gaul, adding to the motivation behind their casting of their agreements with Roma side and attacking the newly founded Roman colonies, forming the reason why in July 218 BC, Scipio Sr.'s army was making its way northwards from Rome, and his son, our Scipio, traveling within the column, closing in on adulthood, and while not referenced as a particularly imposing figure, undoubtedly possessing a well-muscled frame from the physical training that he would have endured throughout his initial 18 years, though appearance-wise, standing out due to his preference for keeping a clean-shaven face in longer hair than was typical for Romans, as a result of his interest in all things Greek. Reputed throughout his life to have exhibited a high degree of self-control and discipline, while presenting himself with calm confidence, and despite his aristocratic patrician upbringing, quickly adapting to the rigors of military life, apparently quite at home among the soldiery when on campaign. And while there would have been a lot of pressure riding on Scipio to live up to and advance the dignitas of the Corneli Scipione name, understanding that Rome at its very foundation was a warrior society, as such military service forming the basis of the cursus honorum, translated to the course of honors, the essential starting point of the path for anyone seeking future advancement in the Republic's hierarchy of public offices, If so, he appears to have taken all these pressures and expectations in stride, right from the onset, showing himself highly dedicated and immersing himself fully into his military career. And we can imagine, throughout the four months training at the Campus Martius and into the initial stages of the march, the young Scipio closely shadowing his father and uncle, absorbing valuable lessons about what it took to lead an army all the details one needs to think about. How to train soldiers, handle senior officers, exert discipline when needed, all the while considering other important administrative functions, such as communications, logistics to keep them fed, scouting and mapping out routes in the process, and perhaps most importantly, the changing fortunes of war a notion to which he was about to get his first sharp lesson on, because weeks into their march, in late July, his father, Scipio Sr., received urgent news from Rome, requiring him to immediately pivot and change course from his original objective. Learning that, 
a large Carthaginian army, had weeks past, crossed the Ebro River in northern Hispania, moving northeast along the coast to the Pyrenees Mountains, the range that today straddles the border between modern Spain and France. The Ebro River, that by virtue of an agreement made between the two nations in 226 BC, marked the dividing line between Carthage and Rome's areas of authority, a line that both sides were forbidden to cross bearing arms, but that Carthage had now violated, at the spear tip of which was Hannibal, who had departed in spring, probably around May 218 BC, from his base in Carthago Nova, today the city of Cartagena, on the southeastern coast of Spain. At the start of his incredible march, among the most impressive in all military history, to ultimately break through the Alps and invade Rome by land. Perhaps begging the question, did the Romans understand Hannibal's true intentions here? Now, this is a notion fiercely debated among historians, but I tend to fall on the side of probably not, because although some may have brought this forward as a possibility, the vast majority would have tossed this out as quite preposterous, citing the distance needed to be covered, over 1,500 kilometers or nearly 1,000 miles, along with the impracticality of maintaining supply lines over the length of the route to support such a campaign, made worse by the many hostile tribal nations found along the path, not to mention the formidable geographical barriers. Instead, what I think would have been far more reasonable for the Romans to conclude was that Hannibal was aiming to expand the Carthaginian Empire's holdings in Iberia through to the northeast of the peninsula, while also picking off the city-states in this area that had bound themselves in friendship to Rome and through more formal alliances. For example, those north of the Ebro River, along the northeastern Spanish coast, including Taraco, today known as Tarragona, and Emporie, located about 150 kilometers to the northeast of modern Barcelona. Why would Hannibal bother with these cities? Because, remember, like we covered in the first episode, after the Roman Republic's victories in the Pyrrhic War and the subsequent First Punic War, it became abundantly clear to many such smaller independent cities and nations of the western Mediterranean that Rome was emerging on the wider stage as a force to be reckoned with. Accordingly, during the years and decades preceding the Second Punic War, many of these entities began actively reaching out to Rome, looking to establish more formal ties and alliances in order to keep other wolves at bay. In turn, granting Rome broader influence and extended presence beyond the Italian peninsula, while providing commercial and trade benefits for both sides as well. And beyond these Iberian cities, this including another important, relatively close-by Roman allied city in southern Gaul, Massilia, modern Marseille, that for good reason had all become extremely alarmed by the Carthaginian movements, suspecting Hannibal's appetite for conquest and his designs on eliminating any Roman presence so close to the Carthaginian domains. A suspicion made much more credible when Hannibal led his army across the Ebro in June 218, bearing down on the city of Taraco. And upon learning of this in July, causing Scipio Sr. to send only a portion of his army north to help secure the colonies of Placentia and Cremona in the Po Valley, estimated at somewhere in between one-third to nearly half his original force. Leaving Scipio Sr., accompanied by his brother Neus, and his son, R. Scipio, with two legions, roughly nine to 10,000 troops, that gathered at the port near the modern Italian city of Pisa, where a Roman fleet was called to transport them to Massilia. But perhaps, as they awaited the fleet that was to ferry them across the sea, underpinned by what must have been a deeply unsettling thought. Since what the large Carthaginian army, led by Hannibal, represented, daring to cross the Ebro River in flagrant disregard for the boundaries and rules set by Rome, 
was not the expected actions of a weakened adversary that the Romans had soundly defeated before. And, evidently, not one seeking to fight a purely defensive war, bracing themselves for the arrival of Rome's legions on their lands. But instead, as would become exceedingly clear in the months and years to follow, a wholly reinvigorated adversary, under a bold and proactive commander. But hold on, how did all that come to fruition? Didn't the Romans see this Carthaginian storm brewing? Well, let's backtrack a bit and get into this now. Because the Roman Senate, by this point, definitely had some awareness and growing concern surrounding the Carthaginian expansion in the Iberian Peninsula following the First Punic War. But beyond being distracted with their other theaters of focus, it was simply a miscalculation. Unable to comprehend the scope of Carthage's turnaround, achieved in such a remarkably short time frame, made all the more impressive considering that, as we touched on earlier, at the conclusion of the First Punic War in 241 BC, the Carthaginian Empire had indeed been decisively defeated and frankly was in a terrible mess. Their naval fleet and dominance smashed, lost to the Roman Republic, along with the island of Sicily, which left them powerless to do anything other than complain when Rome annexed the islands of Corsica and Sardinia. Carthage was, in short, utterly humiliated and deep in the financial hole, which significantly added to their woes since, as mentioned by Barnaby Rogerson in his book, In Search of Ancient North Africa, due to the war-shattered Carthaginian treasury, made worse by the heavy war indemnity payments imposed by Rome, Carthage couldn't pay out some 20,000 of its veteran troops and mercenaries, which ignited a bitter three-year civil conflict from 240 to 237 BC, called the Truceless War. So we have here, on top of everything else, Carthage drowning in domestic turmoil, facing an implosion from within, their capital city even besieged by their own malign troops. Thankfully, however, what they did have was a phenomenal general by the name of Hamilcar Barca, who we were introduced to in part one, and that you might recall, despite attached to the losing side, had performed exceptionally well in the First Punic War, never losing a battle himself. And that, once again, emerged as a Carthaginian hero, figuring out how to break the siege, then command over a ruthless and hard-fought, but ultimately successful campaign over the mutinous troops. These feats, combined with his actions during the First Punic War, propelling Hamilcar to emerge as a leading political figure in Carthage. His political rhetoric, singular in its view, dripping with an unyielding hatred of Rome, calling for retribution, while loudly antagonizing the members of the Council of Elders, the Carthaginian version of the Roman Senate, that had agreed to the humiliating peace treaty and that had since followed a policy of appeasement to the subsequent Roman aggressions. Hamilcar, repeatedly emphasizing the point that Rome would never be satisfied until Carthage was no more, or Carthage put a stop to them. Accordingly, in the pursuit of rebuilding Carthage's strength, getting them back into fighting shape, to eventually reopen hostilities against Rome, which he saw as inevitable, Hamilcar unveiled a master plan that in 237 BC, after quelling the civil war, the Council of Elders gave their blessing for him to proceed with, which was to raise a small army, whatever could be scraped together, likely in the low thousands, and lead them in the expansion of the Carthaginian Empire's holdings in the Iberian Peninsula, which in 237 only consisted of a thin strip of coastline along what is today's southern Spain. Hamilcar also bringing along his three young sons, that according to the ancient Roman historian Valerius Maximus, Hamilcar often boasted about, describing them as, a brood of lions raised for Rome's destruction. The eldest, Hannibal, 
who was 10 years old at the time, and his two younger brothers, Hasdrubal and Mago. Hamilcar bringing them along in this venture, aiming to mold them into the next generation of Carthage's best commanders. A title to which his eldest would prove unrivaled. Hannibal, a name deep in religious meaning, bestowed in honor of the principal god of the Carthaginians, Baal, also referred to as the Lord of the Fires. According to Patrick Hunt in his book Hannibal, Hannibal's name meaning something akin to Baal be gracious or merciful to me, who was born in 247 BC into the influential Barca family that owned large farming estates several days travel south to the city of Carthage. And, interestingly, quite similar to that of Scipio's story and that of the Cornelii Scipione's importance in Rome, the Barcas had long been one of the great aristocratic families of Carthage, playing in the top echelons of its political order, with some of his forebearers, none less so than his father, Hamilcar also coming from a notable military tradition. Meaning that, while Hannibal was undoubtedly well-versed in his glorious family history, and that Carthage for centuries past had ruled the western Mediterranean unopposed, during his first ten years, he would have grown up in Carthage experiencing something entirely different, seeing his nation going through some of its most difficult times, downtrodden, with the Roman Republic pointed to as the sole cause of all its problems. Of course, heavily attuned and influenced in this belief by his father Hamilcar, who prior to sailing off with him to Spain in 237 BC, from both Polybius and the ancient Roman historian Livy, we learn that Hamilcar brought Hannibal to one of the most magnificent and certainly sacred buildings in Carthage, the Temple of Baal, where, Hamilcar led his son up to the altar, and bade him to lay his hands upon the sacrificial animal, about to be given to Baal's flames. This is the moment Hannibal swore an oath of eternal enmity to Rome. Now, when Hamilcar led his small expeditionary force into Spain in 237 BC, landing at the Carthaginian city of Gadez, modern Cadiz, on the southern tip of the Iberian Peninsula. This became the starting point from where Hannibal and his brothers would witness, over the next nine years as a part of their apprenticeship for future command, their father presiding over a truly magnificent campaign. Hamilcar using an expert blend of sheer force and cunning diplomacy to grow the Carthaginian Empire's authority and presence in Spain exponentially. First and foremost, concentrating his earliest efforts on pushing northeast into the interior of the peninsula in order to secure control over the incredibly rich silver mines found in southeastern Spain, which had always been the central piece to his entire plan, since this was used to fuel and fund his campaign from there on in to procure allies amongst the various Iberian and Celtiberian tribes in the region, enlisting them as mercenaries under his command and paying them handsomely to ensure their loyalty. The silver also used to finance the construction of important settlements and forts along the south and eastern coasts of the peninsula, with some of the wealth used by Hamilcar to buy himself more political support from the Council of Elders back in the Carthaginian capital who, once it began dawning on them how valuable Spain was to their future, evidenced by the silver that was being shipped into their treasury, in turn they sent Hamilcar more North African troops to not just maintain, but further expand the Punic footprint there. All the while, Hamilcar, the skilled general that he was, delivering an impressive string of battlefield victories upon the Hispanian tribes that opposed him. Going back to the words of Barnaby Rogerson, After nine years of war, Hamilcar had succeeded in carving out a whole new empire for Carthage that was entirely self-financing, fed by his control over the famous silver mines. His sons, always in the field accompanying their father, learning how to fight and how to lead, 
Hannibal in particular, into his late teens, gradually taking on more military duties and responsibilities, including leading units within his father's army. However, in 228 BC, while fighting to push further northwards, Hamilcar's glittering career finally coming to an end when slain in battle against the Vetoni tribe in central Spain. And since Hannibal, though filled with promise, was only 17, not yet old enough to lead, the command in Carthaginian Spain went instead to his brother-in-law, Hasdrubal, who, following Hamilcar's strategy, did an able job himself. Of note, founding the coastal city, Carthago Nova, New Carthage, today known as Cartagena, which became the principal Carthaginian city in Hispania, a vital port close to the lucrative silver mines, while also expanding the size of the army in Spain, that he used to extend Carthaginian influence as far north as the Tagus River that cuts across the width of the Iberian Peninsula a period during which Hannibal matured into an exceptional general, responsible for much of the continued Carthaginian military success and conquest in this theatre. However, the one thing Hasdrubal lacked was a posture of defiance towards Rome, reportedly taking more of a conciliatory diplomatic approach during his dealings with Roman envoys, bending to their demands. In that, the Roman Senate, throughout Hamilcar's and then Hasdrubal's successive rules, although, like we covered earlier, were much more preoccupied with entrenching Roman domination over Cisalpine Gaul and the Illyrian coast, it wasn't lost on them that Carthage had become tremendously active in Iberia, resulting in Roman delegations increasingly being sent to Spain to keep watchful eyes on the unfolding situation. As far back as 231, when Hamilcar had still been at the helm, but apparently satisfied with his response that Carthage's aggressive interest in the region was purely for economic reasons, the silver mines especially, as a means to stave off the Punic Empire's looming bankruptcy and ensure that the war indemnity payments owed to Rome continued to be fulfilled. Though it was more so Hasdrubal who had to deal with the Roman Senate taking a more authoritative tone, as they began waking up to the power that Carthage was amassing in Hispania, which led to the imposition of the Ebro River Agreement, signed by Hasdrubal in 226 BC, wherein Carthage was prohibited from expanding beyond this boundary, while Rome promised not to involve itself in affairs south of the river. The political sentiment in Carthage, bitter not taking well to Rome again dictating what they were allowed and not allowed to do, nor imposing limits on their ambitions. And whether it was irritation over Hasdrubal's diplomatic approach to Rome that may have contributed to his eventual assassination in 221 BC, we can't say for sure. However, what's clear is that upon his death, the 25-year-old Hannibal was immediately hailed by the army to be the new leader of Carthaginian Spain, his promotion soon ratified by the Council of Elders in Carthage. By all accounts, shaped from his living of a military life from the age of 10, Hannibal made for a physically imposing specimen, and according to Livy, he even looked like his father, possessing the same intense expression and penetrating gaze, the same confidence and strong-willed countenance. Although, for the personality description that most resonated with me, let's go to Barry Strauss, who wrote that, Hannibal was a man of extremes. His mind was quick and astute, but his body was indifferent to pain. He had a sense of humor and a violent temper. He was a man of honor, but his critics said he ignored his promises when it suited him. And for the next two years, Hannibal, in the likeness of his father, aggressively set to work, exhibiting fierce military prowess and masterful leadership, adding to the Carthaginian army in Hispania, building it into a cohesive force estimated to be well over 100,000 strong, 
made up of a wide array of excellent troops from all over the Carthaginian Empire. And although we sadly don't have an exact breakdown, it included Carthaginian and Libyan spear and sword wielding heavy infantry and heavy horse that formed the backbone of the army. The bulk of the troops coming from the Iberian Peninsula, consisting of both medium and light infantry and cavalry. Exceptionally quick and maneuverable, javelin-throwing Numidian light cavalry from what would be today Algeria in North Africa, with some of the other fascinating units in his army including the famously accurate slingers from the Balearic Islands that could cast their projectiles from 400 meters away. And finally, a body of lumbering war elephants that were excellent for sowing fear and disrupting the formations of whatever dared to stay in their way. Topped off by the notion that much of his grand army was, in effect, a veteran standing army, battle-hardened from all the years of warring under Hamilcar and Hasdrubal. And as Barry Strauss goes on to point out, because they were professionals, Hannibal's men had the training to carry out maneuvers that Rome citizen soldiers could only dream of, from their youth trained in actual, near-constant warfare and combat, in the hands of a general that, too, had been cultivated from youth to lead operations in the field. Therefore, probably coming as no surprise to us, that upon taking the reins, Hannibal was able to put his army to use, at a notably rapid pace, to conquer and subdue much of the Iberian Peninsula south of the Ebro, while also ensuring that the immense wagon trains of silver, with increased intensity, were being carted off to Carthago Nova, where coins, marked by Barca dynastic images, were minted to maintain the flow of coins being shipped to the Carthaginian capital in North Africa, keep his massive army well paid, always compensating his top commanders and mercenaries appropriately, but with some of the wealth set aside in order to build up his war chest for what was to come. Because what Hannibal must have known, beyond the shadow of a doubt, was that there would be no turning back from his next actions, inevitably cascading into war against Rome. Understanding that, by 219 BC, Although Carthage controlled much of Iberia, up to the Ebro, more than half the entire peninsula, there was one glaring hole, the city of Saguntum, near the modern city of Valencia on Spain's eastern coast, that was allied to Rome. Although some of the blame for this messy situation and the onset of the Second Punic War has to be shared by the Roman Republic, being that their alliance with Saguntum had been signed at some point during the initial two years after Hannibal assumed the command in Spain, thereby violating the 226 BC agreement made between Rome and Carthage, since Saguntum was located well south of the Ebro River, within Carthage's sphere of influence, where Rome had promised not to meddle. The inhabitants there seeking a deterrent to avoid being swallowed up by Carthage while in turn providing Rome with a perfect locale, a beachhead from which future incursions could be made into the heart of Carthaginian Spain, should the need arise or when they got around to it, after mopping up their operations in Cisalpine Gaul and Illyria, a threat that Hannibal anticipated. And so, over the winter of 220-219 to BC, when the inhabitants of the city became embroiled in a small conflict with a neighboring tribe that was loyal to Carthage, this event provided the perfect justification for Hannibal to intervene, with hostilities quickly amped up from there, when in the early spring of 219, the Carthaginian general at the head of a large army laid siege to Saguntum. The Roman Senate not yet declaring war, choosing instead to send an embassy to Spain as the siege was underway. But when they arrived, let's just say things didn't go very well, Hannibal refusing to grant them a formal audience, and Polybius describing the interaction as a brief and curt exchange, with the Roman envoy rather insultingly 
dismissed, intoned, to immediately remove themselves from Hispania, which they did, sailing from Saguntum directly to North Africa, landing at Carthage to make their appeal with the Council of Elders, demanding that Hannibal be ordered to call off the siege and be handed over to Rome, dangling the possibility of war if they refused. But finding the Council of Elders unwilling to waver, arguing that it was Rome that had been in the wrong in the first place for having broken the Ebro River Agreement, allying themselves with Saguntum. Though underneath this argument, obviously influenced by the wealth pouring into their city from Hannibal's hand, and the fact that he had an enormous and fiercely loyal army under his command. Regardless, the tension was palpable, promises of war hanging thickly in the air. But even then, when the envoy returned to Rome in mid-219, having accomplished nothing, even then they didn't declare war upon Carthage. And the Roman Senate continued to send its legions to subdue the Gauls in northern Italy, and deal with piracy along the Illyrian coast, reluctant to start war with Carthage until the disturbances in these regions had been appropriately silenced. However, in the late autumn of 219, after an eight-month siege, when Hannibal made a horrific example out of Saguntum, a message that reverberated throughout the Mediterranean, having viciously sacked the city, plundering all its wealth, and according to Livy, commanding that all the adults be put to the sword. Those hiding in houses burned down over top of them, as if in a funeral pyre, and the children enslaved. This brutal and complete eradication of their ally amounted to a direct affront and challenge to the Roman Republic that they simply couldn't put off any longer, immediately sending a delegation to Carthage, where, as the Romans again stood before the Council of Elders, listening to them reiterate the same rationale and arguments they had made in the previous meeting, let's go to Polybius to help us paint the picture. The Romans made no other reply but the following. The most senior of the embassy, pointing to his toga, announcing that he held declarations of both war and peace within its folds and that he would let fall whichever of the two they bade him. And when the Carthaginians responded by asking which Rome preferred, the Roman ambassador proceeded to pull out the declaration of war, threatening to release it, to which the council of elders angrily shouted at him to drop it, accepting the outcome of war, just as the declaration fell to the floor. The Second Punic War was now at hand. However, with the Roman Republic brimming with supreme confidence, since they felt secure from Carthage's reach, expecting them to fight a defensive war for all the reasons mentioned earlier, unable to fathom that they would soon be faced with one of the greatest existential threats it would ever endure, pushed dangerously close to the breaking point. Accordingly, in 218, as spring gave way to summer, and the consuls for the year were given their directives, eventually planning to bring war to Carthaginian lands, Scipio senior to Spain, but first needing to quell the unrest in northern Italy, Tiberius Sempronius Longus to North Africa, but taking his time with the preparations for the invasion. What they couldn't have known was that ever since the dropping of that war declaration, Hannibal through the winter of 219 to 218 BC, from his base in Carthago Nova, had immediately set to work at a furious pace, making massive preparations for his invasion into Italy, including sending envoys to the disgruntled tribes of Cisalpine Gaul to secure alliances with the Boii and the Insubres, promising to join them there and help free them from the Roman yoke. Also setting up his brother, Hasdrubal, in command of Spain with a strong defensive army of approximately 30,000, before departing from New Carthage in the early spring of 218 BC, at the head of just over 80,000 troops, 70,000 infantry, 12,000 cavalry, 37 war elephants, and a huge war chest of silver. 
marching at an aggressive pace northwards, crossing the Ebro River sometime in June, which, as we know, tripped the alarm bells to go off in Rome, forcing Scipio Sr. to split off a detachment of his army northwards to the Po Valley, and leaving him with two legions that were to be transported from Pisa to Massilia, which probably didn't depart until around mid-August. While during this time, from June until mid-August, Hannibal's army progressed steadily up the northeastern Spanish coast, towards the Pyrenees Mountains, encountering hostile tribal nations along the way, not taking kindly to a Carthaginian army moving through their lands, but that were either soundly crushed or convinced by silver to comply with the Carthaginian general, as were the aforementioned city-states friendly to Rome, Taraco and Emporiae, that quickly fell under his sway, seeing the immense army that Hannibal had with him, and wanting to avoid the horrendous fate that befell Saguntum. With Hannibal then quickly marching off, crossing through the Pyrenees Mountains into southwestern Gaul in late August or early September. By this point, Hannibal's army reduced to around 40,000 infantry, 10,000 cavalry, and 37 elephants. Some of these losses attributed to casualties, but also because Hannibal peeled off about 15,000 to defend the newly acquired domains in northern Spain, with the balance of the reduction stemming from some Spanish troops deserting, others dismissed from his army, unwilling to venture too far away from their lands. Though altogether, still leaving Hannibal with a large and powerful army, 50,000 that advanced quickly along the coastline, approaching in the direction of Massilia, situated to the east of the Rhone River, where it drains into the Mediterranean. Now, what this late August, early September timing also coincided with was the arrival of Scipio Sr. at Massilia, with his two legions in tow, some nine to 10,000 Roman and Italian allied soldiers, including our Scipio, that upon arriving at the city, immediately set up a fortified encampment nearby while taking stock of the evolving situation, trying to nail down Hannibal's position. From the Massilians, learning of all the up-to-date news regarding Hannibal's exploits in northern Spain, and that he had already crossed the Pyrenees, making rapid progress, expected to hit Massilia any day now. Yet these same incoming reports also yielding a confused mix of answers as to the location of Hannibal's main army. Scipio, watching his father work to get more definitive answers, sending Roman ships west, skirting the coast, looking for any telltale signs, while Roman cavalry scoured the countryside, all their efforts coming up empty. And aside from one instance, when a group of 300 Roman and 200 Carthaginian cavalry by accident crashed into one another, resulting in a particularly nasty skirmish, wherein almost all of the Carthaginians were slain and the Romans losing almost 50% of their number. This got them no closer to answering the question, where was the main Carthaginian army? Surely they should have reached Massilia by now. However, the fact is, that Massilia had never been a target, and the Carthaginian general wanted to avoid getting bogged down in any battles against Roman forces outside of Italy, which is also why he didn't continue following along the coastline of southern Gaul into Italy, a route fully controlled by Rome, laden with forts and garrisons. Hannibal was determined to fight the war in Italy. As such, he took great pains to conceal the whereabouts of his army. During his coastline approach to Massilia, suddenly pivoting from this path, abruptly marching his army inland, using the thick forests of southern Gaul to keep hidden from view as he led them north to the western bank of the Rhone River, where he intended to cross near modern Avignon in France. A crossing that would prove a serious challenge not just due to the river itself, several hundred yards wide, 
and the difficulty getting loads of troops, equipment, food, etc. across the waterway, along with 37 war elephants. But made worse by the hostile Celtic tribe called the Volque, that awaited on the eastern bank of the Rhone, readying to hit at the Carthaginians if they dared to cross, where they would be extremely vulnerable in order to dissuade this foreign army from entering their lands, while giving the Volque a prime chance to plunder their food and equipment. So, in addition to his clever game of hide-and-seek, keeping hidden from Roman eyes, this sight also begins revealing to us Hannibal's tactical prowess. Without going into too much detail, Hannibal, under the cover of darkness and the dense forest, sending out numerous small, quick-moving units, both cavalry and infantry, that made their way upriver to cross the Rhone. Wherein, upon seeing smoke signals waft into the air, communicating that his detachment was in position, Hannibal ordered the bulk of his army to begin the river crossing, drawing the warriors of the Volque tribe to assemble on the eastern bank, expecting easy pickings, but caught entirely by surprise, when Carthaginian troops smashed into them from behind, causing heavy casualties and scattering the rest, allowing Hannibal to complete the crossing. An operation dependent on impeccable timing, executed to perfection. And by the time the Romans learned of what had happened there, Scipio Sr.'s scouting parties finally discovering the Carthaginian camp where they had made the crossing, they soon came to learn that the camp had been abandoned for almost a week, with the Carthaginian host long gone moving north, rushing back to Massilia to bring this urgent news to Scipio Sr., who, realizing that he was a week behind, outmaneuvered by Hannibal, he knew it would have been pointless to mobilize his legions and give chase, with no reasonable hope of catching them. But what this news would have also revealed to Scipio Sr., I imagine still hard to fully accept, but now, undeniable, was Hannibal's true intentions. And that, as a result of where his army was headed, that he was looking to gain entry to northern Italy through the Alps. Scipio's father immediately sending communications to the Roman Senate, along with his plan to stop the wily Carthaginian commander. Handing over the command of the two legions to his brother, Gnaeus, and ordering him to proceed westwards from Massilia to begin attacking Carthage's recent acquisitions in northern Spain, in order to disrupt Hannibal's supply lines and any chance of reinforcements being sent from Spain. While Scipio Sr., accompanied by his son and a small portion of their troops, set sail back to Italy, where he planned to rendezvous with the detachments that he had previously sent to the Po Valley, and used this force to smash Hannibal's army as they emerged from the unforgiving Alps, probably wagering, and rightly so, that the Carthaginians would be depleted and exhausted from the last legs of its arduous march. Though a quick side note here is that this is probably the point that, while the Roman Senate didn't outright cancel Longus's invasion of North Africa, he was probably put on high alert ordered to stay in Sicily, but be ready to bring his legions north, in the event that Scipio Sr. failed in his attempt. But going back now to Hannibal, it was now mid-September 218 BC, and the next weeks would indeed put his army to the test, marching north from Avignon along the western banks of the Rhone River, through Upper Provence, and then turning east, where the geography changes, giving way to the foothills of the Alps, the peaks of which would have now been seen far off in the horizon. Hannibal driving his army at an aggressive pace, determined to get through the Alps before winter set in, choking the passes closed. Reaching the base of the mountain range towards mid-October, the final leg of their journey into northern Italy, that Polybius tells us took 15 days to complete from beginning to end. Although I think it's important to state that we can't emphasize enough how difficult these 15 days must have been for them, because even though it wasn't yet winter, 
The autumn weather made their march increasingly precarious as they made the ascent. Wet and cold, facing hypothermia, night temperatures plunging below zero degrees Celsius, and as if the natural elements weren't challenge enough, there were hostile Celtic nations that resided in these lands, forcing Hannibal to deal with two serious ambushes, one from the Allobroges, and just days after, followed by an attack from a tribe known as the Meduli. Raids that, although fought off by the Carthaginian force, wreaked havoc on their pack animals and supplies, as well as some rather heavy casualties, which made their climb to the peaks all the more difficult. These Carthaginian troops from Spain and North Africa, used to hot climates, struggling terribly in the cold altitude, gasping for air, not used to the conditions, now facing treacherous, ice-laden passes and the onset of sudden snow squalls. Yet, as a testament to his leadership, Hannibal managing to keep his army moving forward, a commander that led by example, as detailed by Patrick Hunt, in that, Hannibal, instead of demanding special comforts befitting his rank as Carthaginian nobility and their general, Hannibal slept humbly on the hard ground just like his tough soldiers, wrapped only in a few heavy blankets. A notion further solidified by Livy, who wrote, Never before was there a more suited genius for commanding respect and obedience from his men, nor did any other leader fill his men with courage and boldness. In addition, he took not comforts or pleasure beyond those of his men. The things that set him apart were not his clothes, which were identical to those of his men, but, above all, his position to be first into battle and last out. Hannibal thus, acting as the driving force to push his army through the Alps, finally landing them in northern Italy just as October gave way to November establishing their camp in the region of the Torini Gallic tribe, near the modern city of Turin, where they rested for three days. Though it must be said that this epic march had taken a serious toll on his army, since you may recall that, months back when they had crossed the Pyrenees, Hannibal's army at that time counted around 50,000. However, by this point, his force had been cut nearly in half reduced to an estimated 20,000 infantry and not more than 6,000 cavalry, and interestingly, the 37 war elephants, which somehow all survived the trek. Granted, many of his soldiers in a dismal state, suffering from frostbite, Polybius describing them as emerging out of the Alps, appearing more like beasts than men in outer appearance and general condition. And the sobering reality was that this was just the beginning for them, now facing war against the Roman Republic. And although their plight became slightly improved by the arrival of a trickle of Boii and Insubre warriors, their strongest Gallic allies in the Po, when Hannibal, right after arriving in the region, in the attempt to start replacing his much-reduced ranks, and ignite a broader swath of Gallic tribes to rise up against Rome, first reached out to the nearby Torini tribe to form an alliance. This offer was met with a resounding no, the Torini citing the meagerness of the Carthaginian army, and the absurdity of this force being capable of defeating the legions of Rome. Hannibal knew he had to make a firm statement. So after briefly resting his army, he unleashed a devastating surprise attack on the Torini, which helped from both a practical standpoint to replenish their lost provisions, while certainly giving note to the wider group of Gallic tribes inhabiting the Po Valley that the Carthaginians had indeed arrived, a powerful force not to be trifled with. But what this loud action also did was call the attention of Scipio Sr., who, if not aware by now, became firmly aware of where the Carthaginians were situated, causing Scipio Sr. to immediately set out in pursuit, departing from his headquarters at the Roman colony of Placentia, where they had been waiting for weeks in anticipation of Hannibal's arrival. 
Admittedly, the number of troops at Scipio Sr.'s disposal, from the various sources gathered, ranging quite a bit. But from what I've been able to gather, based on the combination of the detachments he earlier sent to northern Italy, those that sailed back with him from Massilia, along with the Roman garrisons in the region that he pulled from, Scipio Sr.'s total strength amounting to somewhere in the realm of two to 4,000 heavy infantry that he left behind to defend Placentia and Cremona, and Scipio Sr. choosing to give chase to Hannibal's army with his more mobile troops, including 3,600 Roman and Italian allied heavy cavalry, 3,000 javelin-throwing light infantry called velites, augmented by 2,000 cavalry from their Gallic allies, all in all, a pretty sizable force totaling around 8,600. And the 18-year-old Scipio too, with his small command of horsemen accompanying his father. That, from Placentia, traveled westward along the northern bank of the Po River, crossing its tributary, the Tequinus River, today called the Tequino, about 40 kilometers to the south of modern Milan. Shortly after making that crossing, marking the site where, in the cold, dreary, and rain-soaked November of 218 BC, that the first battle of the Second Punic War would be fought. The Battle of Tecinus. The Romans coming face to face with Hannibal, at the head of a forward group of 6,000 Carthaginian cavalry, which, although we don't know the exact breakdown, is assumed to have been a mix of heavy and medium cavalry, made up of North African, Spanish, and Gallic units, along with a strong contingent of Numidian light cavalry, all of whom, under Hannibal's direct command, had been making their way eastwards along the Po, since Hannibal too, through extensive scouting efforts, was aware of the Roman approach, and equally hungry for a fight, a win, to prove their mettle and get the ball rolling to gain broader support among the Gauls bringing us to the scene that we covered at the top end of this episode. As the two armies happened upon one another, Scipio Sr. first ordering his son Scipio to safety, to watch the battle from a nearby hill with a handful of horsemen under his command, while he set to work organizing his lines, assembling a strong center as per the Roman custom, placing all his light infantry in the middle, supported by the Gallic horsemen behind while the Roman cavalry was split into two wings, and a small reserve of Roman cavalry behind the entire force, where Scipio Sr. was situated. Hannibal responding by positioning in close order all his heavy and medium horse in the center, flanked on both sides by light Numidian cavalry units, which is when Scipio Sr. initiated the battle, ordering his velites forward across the wet plain, with the Gallic cavalry trailing behind, with the intention of softening up the tightly packed Carthaginian center with their javelins, driving Hannibal to counter, ordering his center cavalry to advance with speed, moving so quickly that the Velites, in fear, understanding that they were about to get mowed down, filtered back through the Gallic horsemen behind them causing some disorganization within the Roman lines, and with few velites having had enough time to even cast one javelin into the mass of Carthaginian horsemen, that smashed into the Roman allied Gallic cavalry, as the two opposing center forces violently blended into one another. The Roman velites and their Gallic allies becoming locked in a chaotic melee with the Carthaginian cavalry, many of whom, on both sides, reportedly dismounted to slog it out and win the center. Victory hung in the balance, with no side appearing to have the edge. Though a stalemate that would soon change, when Hannibal ordered his Numidian cavalry wings to engage their Roman heavy cavalry counterparts, wherein, despite the Romans holding the overwhelming advantage in terms of armor, in that the Numidians had very little protection, Aside from small leather shields and light helmets, their weapons consisting of javelins and swords, the problem was the Romans couldn't catch them. Unable to match the speed, 
nor the expert horsemanship of the Numidians, described by Livy as by far the best horsemen in Africa, that proceeded to run circles around the Roman heavy horse, wildly charging in at all angles and throwing their javelins inwards, harassing and inflicting serious casualties upon the Roman cavalry, overwhelming the wings of the Roman army and effectively corralling them, pushing them inwards into the rear and sides of the Roman center that was engaged with the Carthaginian center, squeezing the entire Roman force into a tightly packed and disorganized cauldron, assailed on all sides by the Carthaginians. From their vantage point on the nearby hill overlooking the battlefield, Scipio and his small command, including his childhood friend Gaius Laelius, watching the battle unfold with growing horror, probably in utter disbelief over what they were witnessing. While on the ground, Scipio Sr. made a last attempt to salvage the situation, sending in the Roman reserve to break in in order to give his tightly packed army space to maneuver. A command that left him vulnerable, surrounded by only a few bodyguards, which is when Scipio saw his father come under the fierce assault of a small group of Numidians. And seconds afterwards, upon seeing his father become severely wounded, most likely pierced by a javelin cast into one of his thighs, causing him to fall from his horse, soon to be captured or killed. This became the moment of Scipio's first defining action, roaring into the historical accounts of the battle best described by Polybius, who wrote, When he caught sight of his father in the battle, surrounded by the enemy, and escorted only by two or three horsemen, and dangerously wounded, he at first endeavored to urge those with him to go to the rescue. But when they hung back for a time, owing to the large numbers of the enemy round them, he is said with reckless daring to have charged the encircling force alone. His bravery, however, quickly inspiring those around him on the hilltop to follow, before altogether charging forward down the slope to cleave through the Carthaginian encirclement and reach Scipio Sr., who, under the protective cover of his son's shield, was lifted by others and remounted, Scipio Sr. issuing out commands for his forces to retreat while being ushered eastward back to the Tachinus River resulting in the battle turning into an absolute rout for Hannibal, as the disorganized Roman troops desperately attempted to join their consul, and the Numidians on their heels in ruthless pursuit, unrelentingly casting javelins and cutting down the fleeing Roman soldiers, incurring heavy casualties during their flight, made worse by 600 Roman troops, left behind to cover Scipio Sr.'s crossing of the Tachinus River, that were all taken prisoner, marking the end of the Battle of Tachinus, a serious setback for Rome, given just a glimpse of Hannibal's tactical brilliance. The total casualties for the Carthaginians estimated to be under 1,000, whereas for the Romans, this figure may have been as high as 6,000, almost 70% of their entire force. Among the 600 troops captured, this being a blend of Romans, Italian allies, and Gallic allies, with Hannibal doing something quite curious after the battle, alluding to the strategic framework behind his Italian campaign. Although subjecting the Roman prisoners to abhorrent conditions, barely keeping them fed and alive, by contrast, he treated the Italian and Gallic allied soldiers quite well and with respect, in fact freeing them to return to their homes, in exchange for oaths to never raise their arms against Carthage in the future. The message conveyed here, certainly also voiced by Hannibal, was that his fight was not with them, and he hadn't arrived as a conqueror looking to add their lands to the Carthaginian Empire. But his mission was more so that of a liberator, solely focused on bringing Rome down, in part to right the previous wrongs inflicted on Carthage, but in the process freeing all currently under its thumb, the Roman Republic's many allies. 
intending to pull them over to Carthage's side, gaining their confidence and most importantly their support, military and otherwise, to help him complete the mission. To put it mildly, things were not looking good for Rome in the Po Valley. However, it appears that Scipio Sr. was of the firm mindset that the North was far from lost. And thanks to the heroics of his son, despite the terrible wound he sustained, they and what was left of the force that fought at Ticinus managed to quickly limp their way back to Placentia, where Scipio Sr. right away sent riders bringing news to the Roman Senate of what had happened, and the Senate, in turn, quickly sending orders to Scipio's co-consul, Tiberius Sempronius Longus, stationed at Sicily to cancel the invasion of North Africa and without delay bring his legions north. Which Longus, eager for a fight, eager to emerge as the savior of Rome, rapidly responded to, sailing off almost immediately. The mood in Rome, of course, deeply concerned. Troubled by Hannibal's presence in Cisalpine Gaul and the poor showing at the Battle of Tacinus, but optimistic when it came to the odds of future success, being that what had been lacking among the forces that Scipio Sr. led against Hannibal was Rome's best troops, their heavy infantry. An insight that would have also been noted among the Roman soldiers that had been consolidated at Placentia, helping to rebuild their shaken morale along with the understanding that Scipio Sr. was looking like he would survive his grave wound, granted facing an extensive recovery period. And while there wasn't a whole lot for them to celebrate at the moment, Scipio Sr. took this opportunity to add to the rebuilding of their morale by honoring the actions of his valiant son. In a ceremony taking place on the grounds of Placentia, where, surrounded by the troops, in recognition of Scipio's bravery, he offered a civic crown to his son. Appearing as a simple wreath of oak leaves to be worn by the recipient, a civic crown was an extremely prestigious honor given to a Roman soldier that had saved the life of a fellow citizen in battle. A battlefield decoration that the ancient Roman writer Pliny the Elder called the most glorious reward that can be bestowed for military valor, and from whom we also come to learn that, as Scipio Sr. lifted the civic crown to place it atop his son's head, at the last moment, Scipio raised his hand, declining the honor, saying something to the effect of, the action was one that rewarded itself. Undoubtedly, eliciting a chorus of cheers and admiration from the soldiers in attendance. And what we can also take away from this is the understanding that, even from this young age, the charismatic Scipio knew how to publicly work the crowd, something we'll see a lot more of throughout his career, be it troops under his command and in the political arena. However, any emotional lift provided by that scene soon evaporating, when Hannibal, so uniquely skilled at essentially everything military-related, including psychological warfare, in a clear challenge to the Roman Republic's authority in the region, Hannibal marched his army in plain view of Placentia, setting up his encampment uncomfortably close, with only a few kilometers and the Trebia River separating them from the Roman colony an overt challenge to fight, that Hannibal knew the Romans, in the short term, were powerless to respond to, thereby highlighting their weakness and vulnerability, a growing sense of belief in the superiority of the Carthaginians, and that, as intended, alongside, of course, his comprehensive win at the Battle of Ticinus, began winning him broader support among the Gallic tribes, which over the next weeks, would swell the ranks of his army from the 26,000 that made it through the Alps to nearly 40,000, a period during which the tense situation in the Po Valley descended into chaos for Rome, events to which the young Scipio would lay witness, accelerating his military education, receiving poignant lessons in the art of war, 
as he watched his father skillfully navigate through the rapidly deteriorating situation, though many of the lessons gained also coming from Hannibal, his undeniably impressive achievements. Having marched his army from Spain, 1,500 kilometers away, to burst through the Alps into northern Italy, and from the hilltop near the battleground, witness Hannibal conduct a tactical masterpiece at Tachinus. But as the next years would show, proving to only be the beginning of Hannibal's phenomenal campaign, emerging as the greatest threat that Rome had ever faced. In the next episode, we'll pick things up amidst the unfolding chaos in the Po Valley. How Hannibal's posturing led to treachery within the ranks of Scipio Sr.'s army. Soldiers murdered in cold blood as they slept, forcing Scipio Sr. to abandon Placentia. This as Tiberius Sempronius Longus arrived with his legions to salvage the situation. In late December 218 BC, meeting Hannibal at the Battle of the Trebia, resulting in an unmitigated disaster for the Roman Republic. Some 20,000 Roman troops slain, and Cisalpine Gaul lost to Hannibal, with Rome evacuating the north entirely. Scipio Sr. sailing west to rejoin his army and continue with the invasion of Carthaginian Hispania. However, this time not bringing his son, sending Scipio back to Rome instead, where he would continue his military career, appointed by the Senate as a military tribune, a junior officer within the legions. This happening in 217 BC, as Hannibal marched southwards from the Po Valley to tear up the Italian peninsula, crushing numerous legions underfoot, scoring a series of phenomenal victories in the lead-up to the Battle of Cannae in 216 BC, wherein Scipio, as a young officer, would barely escape the bloody carnage of one of Rome's darkest days. Yet in the immediate aftermath, prove himself a fierce Roman patriot by the point of a sword, preventing the desertion of a number of his despairing countrymen. This and more to come in the next episode of the Warlords of History podcast. And in the meantime, if you want to support the podcast, there are many ways you can help. You can tell your family and friends about the show. Please rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you happen to access the show on. You can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And lastly, you can head on over to the show's website warlordsofhistory.com where on the support section of the site you can find the show's Patreon or PayPal links in the event that you want to contribute to the podcast directly. But beyond this, where I'll include some additional info like images and maps pertaining to this episode for your viewing pleasure and where you can also reach out to me with any thoughts, questions, or suggestions. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Theme music from audionautics.com